Hey everybody, I'm Eric Schweitzer from The Gamer, and I'm here with Ryan Miller, co-designer and brand manager of Disney Lorcana. Hello! Ryan, we met at D23 Expo last That's year. That's right. That's right. And at the time, you couldn't say anything <laughs> about this game. That's so true. <laughs> but now, we've learned the rules, we've seen all the cards, we know about organized play, yeah. and in a week from now at Gen Con, oh, people are going to be able to buy yeah. and play the game. I can't wait. Tell me about how it feels to be on the cusp of the release of the first chapter. It's one of those, you know, <laughs> I've been working on this thing for over three years, and uh, I think I might have said it when we were playing, but like making a game is like when you get someone a gift, and you can't wait for them to open it. It's that excitement you feel. You just think, man, I can't wait. They're going to open it. They're going to enjoy it. I can't wait. I can't wait. And I've been doing that for three plus years, right? I'm just yeah. like so excited to get this into people's hands and just, you know, we've been working so hard. The team has been, it's just an amazing team on this. And they've been working so hard. And so to see people get excited about it, to see people enjoying it, playing it, collecting it, all that stuff, I just, I just can't wait. So one of the big changes that came out of D23 was the decision not to print more first edition cards. Oh yeah, so we did, yeah, so on those cards that did have a first edition marker on there, we decided not to do that. Uh, mainly, um, it, our goal is to get this into the hands of the community, right? And so what we want to avoid, if possible, is people kind of like squirreling it away, yeah. right? Uh, because we want people playing and trading and enjoying it, right? And so we felt that the first edition marker might exacerbate that issue, right? And so we said, you know what, let's not do it. We're going to make the cards beautiful cards, they're awesome cards, fun to collect. Uh, they just don't need it. Yeah. They just don't need it, right? So we just, we took that off. But it's still a nice little, uh, I guess, Easter egg on those D23 cards, right? <laughs> it was, you know, I got to say from like a community and like a player perspective, that was such a relief. But also, it was really reassuring to see the way that to know that your team can reassess a situation mm -hmm. and make a big change like that. And it's happened a lot. Um, it's something that, I mean, one of the things I love about trading card games is they're really, because of their ongoing nature, it's a conversation, yeah, right, with the players, with the collectors. Uh, and it starts before the game, in this case, before the game even came out, right? We, we knew from D23, we got feedback there. We were unprepared for D23. <laughs> we did not know that we were going to have the reception that we had there. It was, it you was, didn't know everyone was going to want it. We did not know. We didn't know. We, if we knew, we probably would have brought more <laughs> of those collector sets to sell. Um, but it was amazing. I mean, we had a line out the out of the, I mean, you saw it. it was, you yeah. know, the line went all the way out the hall. We actually had Disney gave us some uh, cast members to help run the line. Uh, and it was, they were great. It was amazing. Uh, we were not prepared for that, but it was really great to, uh, you know, talk to the Disney fans. Uh, and, you know, one of the things, one of my great hopes of this game is that the Disney fans uh, check out a trading card game for the first time yeah. and go, wow, this, this is actually really fun. I really want to try this, right? Uh, even, if, even if they just want to collect, but I think there's really a lot of fun to be had on the play side as well. Yeah. And because that wasn't a card event, that was a Disney event, you got to see right away how Disney fans were going to respond. Yeah, to yeah. It was really cool. I loved it because it was so, like, families and, and couples and all these people. And they were just so excited and they were so, like, energized to come out and, and get some of the cards. And we were also giving away a Mickey card that you yeah. could get there. Um, we had pins that we were giving out. And people were just so excited. And, and it was just, it was one of those things, you know, you work so hard on your computer screen you know, or in your office or at home, you're just working, you're kind of heads down or you're with the team. Uh, and you're just kind of assuming that this is going <laughs> to resonate with somebody, right? right? Uh, and there's always that voice, I think, especially as an artist, like, you know, you always have that voice in your head that's like, mm, is this really going to, you know, and to see that excitement and enthusiasm for what we did was just great. And that's something that is carried through every time we've gone somewhere to show this game off. You know, I was just in UK Games Expo uh, a month ago or so. Um, which is in um, Birmingham, England. Mm -hmm. And it was just wonderful. Uh, there were so many people, so very excited. Well, all we were doing was giving demos. We didn't have any product to sell. We did have pins to give out. But people were like rushing to the booth as soon as the hall opened, just so they can get in line or a queue uh, for for their demo, right? And it yeah. was just great. And there was all sorts, of, again, there was like families coming. Some folks came through a couple of times just to play a few times. Uh, and it's just great to, I mean, I get goosebumps just talking about yeah. it because it's just so great to, you know, I love creating experiences for people. I think especially tabletop games have this wonderful ability to create memories, right? And you sit down, I mean, and digital does that too. I'm not trying to say it doesn't, but there's something about sitting down with friends or family and just playing a game. It's one of the things that has kept me in tabletop. Yeah, and you've been in tabletop 
in card games specifically forever. 25, Magic, 25 years, yeah. yeah Digimon, I, Duel Masters. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I love cards. I always have. Ever since, you know, I started playing Magic when it first came, well, within a year of it first coming out. So I think it was 90, end of 93, 94 is when I started playing. And it just blew my mind. It was so groundbreaking. This Just, you know, the idea of building your own deck was just mind-blowing back then. It was just such yeah. a cool idea. Like, well, I can do what? The game's not going to hand me a thing. I get to decide what I bring to the table. And then just the pure joy of ex of discovery when you open packs and you never know what you're going to find, you know. And it always stuck with me. And I think I designed my first trading card game of, in like 95 or 96. And it was terrible. It was awful. Uh, <laughs> How old were you? Uh, let's see. At that point, nine, uh, 96, I was uh, 23, 22, something like that. Mm. Um, I was playing with my little brother. And <laughs> the game was never going to end. <laughs> and he finally said, dude, I quit. I can't. This is never going to end. <laughs> Because <laughs> it's kind of difficult. It's a difficult style of game to design. You know, it's challenging. Imagine. It's it's. I enjoy it, yeah. um, but it's definitely challenging, right? And and to, you know, to get to come out with like a really fun game design, it's, it's a challenge. It's yeah. fun. It's, I, I love it. So, what are some things about um, this process of de designing Oracana that's been different from all these other games that you've worked on? Oh yeah. So we, you know, so Steve Warner and I. Uh, Steve's a, a dear friend of mine. He was in my wedding. I've known him. We, we both came up in Wizards together, and. Uh, and we've just known each other for 20 plus years. And I'd actually been doing freelance work. Uh, and one of my freelance uh, jobs was working on a Princess Bride board game for Robinsburger. And I'd never worked with Robinsburger before. Steve was already there. And he was kind of like my producer for that game. Uh, I loved Princess Bride. It's all time one of my favorite movies. Definitely. And so to, to do like a game on it was just wonderful, right? Yeah. And I had kind of a neat idea where like the boards are in a big book. So it's kind oh, of like, cool. the, you know, and you're going chapter by chapter trying to tell the story and not piss off the grandson. Like it was just, it was a fun kind of experience. Uh, but what that did is it gave me a window into how Ramsberger thinks and operates mm -hmm. as a company, right? What are their values? Um, and so when Steve, at, towards the end of that process, told me about this project, uh, my normally cynical brain, when it comes to like companies that have you know not done these types of games before, I'm always a little cynical. Like, okay, well, they're really they're very complex games uh, from every aspect: production, art, design, everything. Um, but because I had done that work with them already and saw the result, because I mean, I I mean, I, when I first got my copy of Princess Bride, it was it's so beautiful. There was so much attention to detail, and that is so key, right? It yeah. just shows that like. So whoever made this loves it, right? Yeah. And like, I love it because I, I, and so I designed the game, but then the folks who did the graphic design, the art and everything, it was just gorgeous. And I was like, okay, I think this is a company that can do this. And especially given their background with Disney itself, right? They've done Disney Villainous for many years, a very successful, super fun game. Uh, they've done other Disney products. So they have had a conversation with Disney fans before and a successful one in my opinion. Yeah. And so I'm like, you know, not only can they do it, I think they're the only company that can really do this, right? Really do it right. Mm. And then Robinsberger for their side, they really have invested in this game. They've hired, we've hired a bunch of folks from the trading card game industry to come in and add their expertise. Um, it's, I mean, it's just been, it, it's been impressive to me. Like we put together this team, um, we put together this amazing group of art directors and artists to get the art done, all that stuff. And, you know, from the very beginning, you know, there's this commitment of like, we want to get this right, as right as we can, as early as we can. Now, no one's going to do a perfect launch, right? But we want to do our best because we love this stuff too. We love Disney too, right? Yeah. It's just like, it's dear to us, you know. I've been a Disney fan since I was a little boy, you know. And I remember, you know, my grandmother, you know, we were kind of poor growing up. And so, uh, but we lived, you know, in Bakersfield, which is a, a couple hours north of L.A., and so every once in a while, my grandmother would take me all the way down to Disneyland. Hmm. And it was so special to me. And even at that young age, I was impressed with the immersion of that place. You are transported into Adventureland. You are transported into Star Tours, right? Yeah. Uh, and I just loved that aspect. And that's something that when I started doing gaming, that is something that really resonated with me. Games have this ability to transport us. And I love that, right? Put us in situations we never thought we'd be in. How would you react in this situation, that situation? Or if you're the captain of a ship? Or if you're, you know, I mean, all these great scenarios that you get to kind of imagine yourself in. I love that about yeah. games, right? And so it's something I've always tried to carry through. Uh, so when I, you know, coming from 20 plus years of, of trading card game design and then, you know, you know, 40 plus years of being a Disney fan, <laughs> just putting those things together, I mean, it's, I, I, I can't believe I get to do this, right? It's, yeah. it's a great job. So we just got to play a game, 
And um, one of the things that really impressed me about the cards is how how appropriate the like abilities and the text is to who that character is. Mm. You've done such a great job matching up so that the cards feel like they belong to that character. Yeah, whenever whenever possible. Yeah. So I'm curious in the design process, is it a lot of like um, taking a character and trying to figure out what they should do, or coming up with designs and then matching them to a to a character? I mean, it's a bit of both, but okay. usually we start with the character, right? Usually we start with okay, this card is going to be Moana, you know, whatever, you know, she's an explorer, uh, she wants to journey, she's brave, uh, you know, all these different things. Well, how can we distill that into some sort of ability, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so usually we do that because we the the design team that does the cards. Um, works very closely with, with what we call narrative, right? They're the ones that come up with all the stories for the sets, but they're also the ones that help guide us in which characters to put on the cards from which franchises and that sort of thing. So early on in the design of a set of cards, those two groups are working very closely together because uh, our goal is to get as many of those characters defined early on as possible. And sometimes we'll leave some blanks. We'll just be like, oh, we need a card that draws you two cards okay. or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. And then we'll, after the fact, kind of say, okay, well, this will be that or this will be that. But that's where the other side of that, what you said, is we have abilities, let's match them up. So even in that process, we try to match them up with something that thematically meshes really well. Yeah. And again, it's whenever possible. Not every card is going to be able to do that because sometimes you just need cards to do certain things so that there's a, a, a healthy amount of abilities and types of abilities in the game, right? But with with what we've done with this game, you know, I wanted the cards to be absolutely covered in, in theme. And so we've done things like naming the abilities, these specific names that are specific to that character, right? So you get a little bit of, you know, we had like the frying pan that has the clang ability, yeah. right? Things like that. Um, to add that bit of flavor and help the player kind of make the logical leap of like, oh, what the gameplay is doing versus what the thematic uh, thematics of the card. Right. And then, of course, there's the art, right? The art is a huge tool for that. Uh, the art, you know, does so much for a trading card game. And you know, on, on one level, it's like a mnemonic that helps you remember what the card does, right? Yeah. Uh, and obviously, it makes the cards very collectible and very valuable. Um, but also it does, serves a really nice role of like helping to tell the story of what's happening with that specific card or sometimes even telling the story of what's happening in the set, like little tidbits of story and things like that. Yeah. And when it comes to the art, so much of Lorcana's personality is these reimagined characters with the Dreamborn and the Floodborn. Are those... Are those ideas things that you take to an artist and say, hey, this is what we're looking for? Or do the artists, or do they have a freedom to come up with their own versions of what these characters could be? It's a bit of both as well. Okay. Like sometimes we'll have a specific vision and that generally will come from narrative um, for what a character, you know, so we you mentioned Dreamborn and Floodborn and, and that generally refers to types of characters that are they're shown in ways you've never seen before, yeah. right? Um, like for example, we have Scar from uh, uh, Lion King as if he's made of lava. Right, and it's just a beautiful piece because he's just like got the magma, and he's just looking very, very cool. That was an idea that came straight from narrative, like we, you know. But artists are just amazing people, and and if you give them leeway, they can often come up with something you would never have thought of in a million years. And so we do have a small selection of those folks who do kind of almost like blue sky kind of work, and they yeah. just come up with interesting concepts. And from that, we get ideas that you know that can even inform game design, right? When you see a cool card, you know, a cool piece of concept art, you're like, oh, we've got a We've got to do a card for this, uh, so that's that's part of the fun. Really, yeah. it's so fun. You know, a lot of um, a lot of uh, art. The, the problem with any kind of art, whether it's game design or visual art, is not the problem, but but one of the challenges is that you can literally do anything. Right. And so, really, what what is helpful is when you narrow down your parameters. Yeah. Right. So, if you were to tell me to design a game for you, I would be like, it might take a you know, I don't know. But if you said design a pirate game, I would probably have one for you tomorrow. Right. Like, you know, it's that kind of it speeds things up, but it also focuses the thematic elements. Yeah. Right. So. So, talk to me about those parameters that you had to design the game within. Sure. So we we knew that we wanted this group of people who've never played a trading card game before. Um, we also knew that we wanted existing trading card gamers to find something that you know they were excited about as well. Uh, so when we looked at um, kind of broadening our audience for this game, we try to look at a few different factors like why certain types of players don't like trading card games as much, and you know there's a lot of reasons for that that are outside the design. Um, but the but within the design, one of the things we came up with was what we called confrontation level. Uh, and that's basically like if you think of a, a spectrum between solitaire and chess, right? Okay. You got no confrontation, you got maximum confrontation. Um, and a lot of trading curries tend to live in this kind of area here, right? This like top 
80% right here. Uh, and it works well for them. And, and this isn't just mechanically, this is like thematically too. Like mm -hmm. some card games are about like actually taking your opponent out. Like thematically, I'm here to like, you know, uh, and that's great, that's fine, but it's, it's very confrontational, right? And some gamers aren't a fan of that super high confrontational gaming. So we wanted to kind of pull that back a bit uh, to what you saw earlier, which is uh, you actually don't win this game by confronting your opponent, Yeah. right? You still want to, and confrontation is still an important part of a trading card game because you need to have some ability to interact with what your opponent's doing. But you don't win the game that way. You actually win the game by committing your characters to to questing, uh, and you only slow your opponent down by by interacting or confronting with them. And that's an important distinction, not only mechanically but emotionally. Like it just kind of lightens the mood, I guess, a bit. Right? Uh, you don't feel as as confrontational with your opponents um, as you might in other games. And that was important. We, we wanted to be welcoming, right? Uh, we wanted people to feel like they could come try this out, have a good time with it. They just want their favorite characters out of the table. They want to play a fun game. We can do that. Yeah. We also feel like we hit the other side where it's, uh, you know, that that strategy. There's, there's a lot of interesting strategic points just in the game design alone. Like which card to use as ink is a very skill testing choice, right? Uh, because you're basically looking at the table, you're looking at what your hand is, and you're saying, which of these cards is least useful to me in this situation? Mm -hmm. And that ability to choose the right card, because once you ink it, of course, it's it's done, you're gone, right? Uh, is actually fairly skill testing. But the nice thing is, a new player doesn't have to worry about all that. They can just put a card down, it's no big deal, yeah. right? Uh, but as they grow in skill, uh, they'll start to see the effects of those types of decisions. I think the other decision that's really kind of uh, like a hidden strategic decision is when to a quest and when to challenge, right? At what point, like, like I think in the game we played, uh, you quested too long. You actually should have yeah. pivoted a bit and started challenging my characters to kind of control what I had on the board. Now part of that was hard because I had Pongo who's evasive yeah. and it was harder for you to do that. But I think there were a couple of turns when you were probably better served uh, by trying to slow me down rather than try to race me, right? Yeah. And that's a, just one of those things that as you get better at the game, you feel yourself getting more skilled. You feel yourself understanding these nuances better. That's a fun feeling, right? Like it's fun to feel like, oh, okay, I'm getting better at something because I've learned it. I've learned from my failures or I've learned from my games and I can actually play better. So we really, the parameters for this game were really, you know, a lot of them were those kind of thematic uh, elements of we wanted you to be able to play the characters that you like. We wanted you to, have a good time uh, building decks and we wanted new players to have a, a reasonable entry right a reasonable accessible entry and then the other side of just making sure that we had good strategic choices most of those are actually on the cards you choose to play how you play and that sort of thing but there are those within the game design itself mm -hmm. so it was a really fascinating challenge yeah right it was unlike designing games uh, other games that i've done in the past um, and it was also fun doing that with Steve. I mean, Steve and I, I've worked together with uh, uh, Steve a, a lot, but not as much as a co-designer. And so to be able to work with him on that design level was super fun, right? Mm -hmm. And he was just, he came in with some great ideas. I mean, his idea for, it was his idea to take the ink off of some cards. And that's a really, I mean, it's kind of nerdy. Uh, like, it's kind of like in the weeds a little bit. But what I love about that is that, um, first of all, when you're building your deck, you can't put too many of those cards in, right? Because you'll just be like, oh dear, like I'm, I'm stymied at three ink, right? You're like, I'm not drawing these cards. But what it does for us as designers is that we can actually balance certain strategies. So uh, for example, control is a strategy that's kind of common in a lot of different games. Mm -hmm. And it essentially means it's a control deck is one that like basically mucks with your opponent either by mucking with what they have in play or keeping you from playing it all together, right? And it's not super fun to play against, right? Right. It's not super fun. But it's actually kind of an important deck to have out there. You just don't want it to be the top deck because by having control, it actually keeps other some other types of decks in check. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get a more robust kind of environment where there's lots of different decks that are viable, right? Mm -hmm. But what we can do to balance that is we, like control cards, for example, there's others, but control cards, we can take the ink off of a lot of them. So if you fill your deck with control cards, you're gonna be in trouble a little bit. You have to have another way to win, right? Mm. Uh, and that's really neat. And I've not seen that in other games, that level, that kind of knob that it gives us to, to use to balance the game is really kind of cool. So, cool. and then the other thing was, you know, going, uh, racing up to a total. Like, mm. um, I'm pretty sure that was Steve's idea too, but I can't, I mean, who knows? Um, that was another thing that emotionally is so different, right? Than going down, right? Mm. Um, you're racing towards something. It feels like there's a journey. It feels like you're moving, right? It's got these like really fun emotional beats, uh, but it also means in gameplay um, that no one's ever eliminated until the game is over. So, like I said, you know, when we're playing like in a multiplayer game, you're there the whole time, which is super fun. 
but it just feels different, right? It feels like, you know, we're, we're, we're moving. And, and I really like that feeling that it generates, especially when we tie it to questing and you're on a quest and it really adds some of that immersion that I spoke about earlier. Yeah. Right? So it was a whole lot of different things like that that we kind of put together and we ended up on quite a journey to get to where we got to. Um, as I think I mentioned in the play, in the gameplay, you know, we uh, had a lot of roller coaster moments of just like, oh, we think we're onto something. And then it would just, it's like the first crack in an eggshell and it just makes all the other cracks happen. And you're like, no, nah! next thing you know, you got egg everywhere. And then we'd start all over again with a new design, right? And it was, uh, but then when we started honing in on this, I think the first thing we got was the, the ink system. And it was like, once we get that ink system down, we're like, wait a minute, we got something here. This is interesting. Okay, what else do we want to do, right? And we started kind of working different things and, and it just kind of crystallizes at some point. You know, good game design, when you're working on it, it's kind of like this amorphous blob that kind of floats around. But at some point, it just goes, that's like the best feeling. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, another one of those design parameters is that you're working exclusively with Walt Disney Animated Studios projects. So that that means no Pixar either, right? Well, I mean, I don't like to talk about like what we're going to do in the future or anything like that. Um, but we decided actually that we wanted to focus on the animated features and the shorts um, and start from there, right? Mm -hmm. Because we wanted to kind of lay a strong foundation. I mean, one of the things that you need to do when you bring someone on a journey is they need to trust you first, mm -hmm. right? In any kind of journey you can think of, right? If you're to go along with somebody on some unknown path, you gotta trust them a little bit. And this is actually something I learned as a DJ. I used to DJ clubs in Seattle. And one of the things I, I realized with that job is that, you know, there were all these, I mean, you'd find these songs as a DJ, like, man, I love this song, it's so good, but no one knows it. Yeah. And you just wanna play it, because you're like, man, I think they're gonna love this song. And the problem is if you play it too early, they don't trust you yet. They're like, what, do you, what is this song? I don't know. Okay. So the first part, like the early part of a night at a club, you actually want to play stuff you know they're going to like because they know it already. They know the words or they know whatever. And But what you're doing in that process is gaining their trust. So you, you can then take them on a journey, right? And so later on in the night, you can play those songs and they're just, they're in now. They're like, oh, this is cool. I trust you. Like, I'm going to go with you, right? And that's what we're doing, what we hope to do with Lakana, right? Because okay. we want to gain that trust and uh, before we kind of take you on that journey. Okay, that makes sense. So that's why it's focused on these characters. Yeah, we're going to start. Core. Yeah, we're going to start here. Um, we want to, and that's why also most of the characters are going to be seen as their what we call storyborn, right? That you're going to see them just as they appear in their stories, mm. right? Like uh, like Maui here. Um, we have a smaller section of them that are what we call the dreamborn and the floodborn, and they're the ones that are shown in ways you've never seen before. Um, so we wanted to have that be a smaller subset, like it's like I don't know, 35, 40 percent of the characters. Um, for a couple of reasons, but I think the main one is we wanted to say, hey, if you just like Moana, if you just like Aurora, there's plenty of that here for you. Yeah. You're like, you know, that's, and it, I get that, right? But it's also kind of fun to see, like, kind of the, some of the fun things we've been doing, you know, with some of these characters, you know, without changing, like, we don't intend, and I don't think we'll ever, like, change the core of a character. Like, right. We're not going to make a hero into a villain or something like that. Uh, but we intend to do some pretty fun stuff. And cool. we've got some stuff coming up today. I wish I could talk about well, if I, if you ever go outside that core Disney, I have an idea of somebody that I... <laughs> I noticed you're, you're lobbying pretty hard here. So. <laughs> I have to represent. Yeah, you do. <laughs> um, okay, so I want to ask you about organized play because I know that's something that's really important oh, yeah. to you. Oh, yeah, I love it. I love it. And, um, you know, we found out what the first, like, the 12-week program that stores mm -hmm. are going to be able to participate in, and it's very um, casual. It's yep. focused on accessibility, and I know that before you've talked about um, wanting to create an environment where people can play where they don't feel intimidated. Yeah, I think that's game. important, right? We, we've we got, hopefully we're gonna have a lot of folks who, the idea of going to a store to play a game is, is actually kind of new to them, right? They're yeah. like, oh, this is, this is interesting, right? Because normally you go to a store to like look at things and maybe purchase them, right? Right. Um, but to sit down and play a game is, is, is another step, right? And so what I love to do is bring these new people into these stores because I think a lot of them are going to go, where has this place been all my life, right? This is amazing, yeah. right? These awesome stores. There's all these games I've never heard of that I want to try. There's Lorcana. I can sit and play with other fans, like other players. I, I really want to do that. And so one of the ways that we're trying to facilitate that is with a more casual approach. Um, we're calling kind of a league approach, right? The program itself is called Lorcana Play. Um, but it's really just um, you earn points for doing various participatory things, including right. playing. Like you earn points for winning, but you also earn points for losing. Not as much, but you do earn points. 
Um, and even the store can decide, like you can earn points this way or that way. They can decide, they have some discretion there. And then as you're earning points, when you get to certain levels, then you start to earn special things like special foil cards that are exclusive to that program. Uh, you could get pins. There's some cool game components, things like that. Um, but we, I also want to stress that like if a store has, you know, stores know their players best. Yeah. So if they do get like a competitive group that just wants to run tournaments, that's absolutely fine. Yeah. Like if they want to take those same prizes and the same whatever, this is a recommended program. Okay. We support it with organized play kits that contain the prize support and, and some of the structural support, like a poster for keeping track of points and things like yeah. that. But if they want to run tournaments because that's the kind of group they have, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I don't know your players better than you do, right? I'm not going to pretend. But I would say that this, the approach that we're recommending is so that we can get some of these new folks in, right? So I'm hoping that, that you know, uh, stores will consider trying that so that we can get some of these Disney fans who are maybe, you know, this is a new thing for them, right? Yeah. Uh, so let's see if we can get them to come in and, and join us, right? It's super fun, Yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm sure you can imagine that you know, the second we saw enough cards to make a deck, people started. The hardcore people started theorizing, absolutely, and building. Absolutely, and they want to get they want to get hardcore with it. Yeah, yeah, and we, you know, we've got plans going down the road for for other types of events mm -hmm. that do end up more on the competitive uh, end of the spectrum there. Uh, but our initial offering, you know, at that ground level, like grassroots level, is we want that more welcoming experience. Um, but we definitely have plans in the more competitive. Our area as well because there's all sorts of different types of trading card game right. players and this game actually lends itself very well to competition like there's a lot of different decks that are viable there's a lot of combos and synergies that are just there to be found by the players yeah. you know uh and i think that the tg players are very pleased when they they really start digging into set one yeah. and then of course as new sets come out it kind of changes the game every time you know i think they're going to find a lot of really cool stuff in there yeah. and we've got some good plans for them so it's such a unique thing uh, about this game because you know when you look at a lot of other tcgs some of them i i think of like flesh and blood there is no like casual flesh oh and blood. <laughs> i didn't know that okay you know I mean? yeah <laughs> and you know like um and you know there there is like professional and hardcore pokemon but that game is seen as more of a casual game mm -hmm. and what well, kind of feels like a game that can really like exist in both worlds i think it can i think like you know uh one of the things we wanted to make sure with this game is that it was multiplayer friendly. Like if you want to play three, four, five, we played up to a six player game, um, that the game is fun, that you don't need to change the rules to yeah. play it that way, right? Which is what we ended up doing uh, because that is a more casual format. But really like, or as you mentioned during gameplay, like do people, can we just play to 10 if we want? Of course, you can totally do that if you want, right? It's 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 your game to play, you know? Yeah. Um, we want the casual fans to feel like they have a home here. But it, but I think you know we've got the plans that we've got coming up. I think that you're going to see that there is there's also quite a home for the more competitive. What we what we want to make sure though is like I want the community to be fun and welcoming, and I want them to just there to have a great time. Um, so we're not going to do things like massive cash prizes or anything like that because okay. uh, because that tends to draw a certain type of player, right? Yeah. Um, but we are got some we got some fun stuff coming up, so I think they'll be excited. Cool. And hopefully, I can talk about it one of these days. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that the whole set list is out there, you got to tell me what's your favorite cards, what's your favorite combos. Oh, jeez. You know, it's funny as a designer, my favorite cards tend to be the ones that like the story is really there, yeah. right? The uh, like one of my favorite cards is Ariel on human legs because uh, because she doesn't have a voice, she yeah. gave it up to have the legs. But her ability says she can't sing songs, right? And her flavor text just says dot, 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 right? They, those are the types of cards that I yeah. tend to gravitate towards. I love that. Um, but I, like, my some of my favorite cards uh, and my favorite types of abilities are the kind where, like, when you play this cards, like, when you play this, do something. And then cards that say return that card back to your hand so you get to reuse it. So, like, one of my decks is, like, leans pretty heavily into that. Uh, we saw that Maleficent that when you play or you draw a card. And that's, like, a really, like, subtle but very strong card right it only costs three ink um you know so those kind of you know so like i'm not a hardcore competitive player for lorcana so i see these these cards that are just fun from a uh, from a thematic uh, or story element and those are the ones that, that come to my mind you were um, telling me uh the story about tamatoa yeah so like that was one of my favorite uh ideas that i had uh when we were talking about different characters that we wanted to and moana's my favorite princess movie from a musical standpoint um my favorite princess movie is Princess and the Frog from a story standpoint. Uh, but uh, one of my favorite characters is Tamatoa, of course. You know, Shiny is a great song. Uh, and in that song, he says, I was a drab little crab once. 
And I said, we've got to make that card of him as his drab little crab version. And it's a great piece of art because he's like, he looks kind of like a teenager. He's got these big teeth and he's got almost, they're barnacles, but it looked like pimples on his face. And he's just found a little piece of shiny. It's like his first shiny he's yeah. very excited about. And it's just so fun to be able to capture moments like that. You know, I, I you know, glimmers, uh, uh, glimmers of Disney characters are these magical versions of them that are kind of snapshots, right? And it, that, being able to take these snapshots and really kind of extrapolate or really do some interesting stuff with them has been a really, a really fun part of, of gameplay cool. yeah, for this one. So, I mean, there's, yeah. And it's, it's really hard too, cause you're kind of asking me to pick my favorite kid. <laughs> um, but I have, yeah, it's there, there's a lot to be found in there. So that's Lorcana coming to a hobby store near you August 18th. Check out thegamer.com for a lot more Lorcana.